Good morning, all. Last year, when I became chairman of the subcommittee, I encouraged my colleagues to join me in an effort to make Made in America matter again. Since then, we've had hearings, forums, and some really great discussions on ways to keep uh, American jobs and create new American jobs. Now it's time to roll up our sleeves and to do our job, pass legislation which will help our economy to grow and prosper in the years ahead. The chair now recognizes herself for an opening statement. Throughout our nation's long history, a growing and robust manufacturing sector has helped to make America great. It's been a driving force in our economy since the Industrial Revolution. But as our nation has moved from the atomic age to the space age to the information age, manufacturing has not kept up, losing nearly 6 million American jobs since the beginning of the 21st century. Aging, rusting, and abandoned factories litter the U.S. landscape. Statistics show the manufacturing sector was the hardest hit in terms of job losses during the Great Recession. While manufacturing accounts for just a tenth of our nation's jobs, manufacturing suffered a, th suffered a third of our nation's job losses. We have a chance now to reverse this trend, and I applaud the hard work to, of Mr. Lipinski and Mr. Kinziger in developing a bipartisan plan for improving manufacturing in the United States. The American Manufacturing Competitiveness Act of 2012, H.R. 5865, uh, calls, for the to, for, calls for two presidential reports to Congress outlining a strategy for promoting growth, sustainability, and competitiveness in the manufacturing sector. The reports are due in April 2014 and in 2018. The Act establishes the American Manufacturing Competitive, Competitiveness Board consisting of 15 members, five from the public se sector, including two governors, and 10 from the private sector. The five public appointments are made by the President, while the 10 private sector members are appointed by the House and Senate. The board would be co-chaired by the Secretary of Commerce and one of the private sector members. The duties of the board are, one, to advise the President and Congress on manufacturing issues, two, conduct a rigorous, anal rigorous analysis of the manufacturing sector, and three, develop a national competitiveness strategy, which would be made available for public comment and submitted to the President. The board will then develop and publish for public comment a draft manufacturing strategy based on its analysis and any other information the board determines is appropriate. This strategy will include short-term and long-term goals for improving the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing as well as recommendations for action. The second bill before us today, H.R. 5859, repeals an obsolete provision in the United States Code requiring motor vehicle insurance cost reporting. I also want to commend Mr. Harper and Mr. Owens for their bipartisan work on this legislation. Here's the problem. In 1993, NHTSA issued a final rule requiring new car dealers to make available to buyers a booklet containing the latest information on insurance costs. The information is updated by NHTSA annually based on data from the Highway Loss Data Institute. The information required by this regulation is rarely sought by consumers and its value is highly questionable. Insurance premiums are based primarily on factors that are unrelated to the uh, susceptibility of damage to a particular vehicle, including the driver's age, driving record, location, and miles driven. Additionally, a recent survey of 815 members of the National Automobile Dealers Association reported 96% of its dealers have never been asked by a customer to see the insurance cost booklet that is at issue. Clearly, this is yet another example of where the cost of a federal regulation outweighs its potential benefit. As a nation competing in a tough global economy, we simply can't keep doing business this way. America is at an, at an important crossroads right now. One Direction, lined by job-killing regulatory hurdles, a punitive tax code, and indecisive political leadership, will lead ultimately to a further erosion of our manufacturing base and lost prosperity for future generations of Americans. The other direction, where smart policies and smart minds eventually intersect, could lead instead to resurgence in U.S. manufacturing, putting millions of Americans back to work again and breathing new life into the beleaguered middle class. Both of the bills being discussed today are a step in the right direction, and as chairman of the subcommittee, I plan to bring them up for favorable consideration in the very near future. And now I'm happy to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, uh, for five minutes. Let me thank you, Chairman Bono Mag, to the witnesses today. Thank you very much for, for your testimony. Uh, our first bill today, H.R. 5865, the American Manufacturing Competitiveness Act, would require the President, with the assistance of an appointed board, to conduct a thorough analysis and then publish a national 
strategy on how to best promote the U.S. manufacturing sector in both 2014 and 2018. As we all know, changes in the global economy led to many job losses in U.S. manufacturing over the past three decades. I think we can all agree that we want a stronger manufacturing sector. Manufacturing jobs are high-quality, good-paying jobs. I am heartened that the U.S. manufacturing sector has recovered as strongly as it has uh, from the recession with what is now 33 consecutive months of expansion. But to be truly strong in the area of manufacturing, we must plan for competitiveness in the long term. To uh, his great credit, President Obama understands this. The administration's manufacturing initiatives fully recognize that the future for U.S. manufacturing will only be successful if the American people are successful. Every child must have the chance to learn math and science and have a familiarity with technology. And adults must have the chance to get the education or training that will qualify them for the job that they want. The administration has published a plan endorsed by a wide variety of private sector leaders promoting advanced or high-tech manufacturing. It's Make It in America, Manufacturing Extension Partnership. It aims to create public-private partnerships to encourage the development of new products that can be manufactured here in our country. And it has an ongoing campaign of reshoring, uh, also referred to as insourcing, where it works with states to encourage companies that outsource jobs abroad to bring them back to the United States. These are just a few of the many manufacturing initiatives underway in the Obama administration. Today we are discussing a proposal to add to the federal work underway on manufacturing, a national manufacturing strategy as proposed by the bill before us is already a staple in several other industrialized countries around the world. If we go in the same direction, it will be worth our while to ensure that this additional effort complements steps already being taken. I look forward to, the work, uh, to working with Mr. Lipinski and all of my colleagues to make sure that that is the case. Uh, our second bill today uh, would repeal a little-known provision that requires NHTSA to annually provide auto dealers with a booklet comparing the insurance costs associated with different cars consumers might purchase. As any car owner can tell you, a car that gets damaged more easily is one that is likely to carry higher auto insurance rates for its driver. But when shopping for a car, it's not easy. Uh, it's not so easy to tell how brittle a car is just by looking at it. As it is said, information is power, and this provision in the 1972 law, the Motor Vehicle Information and Cost Savings Act, sought to give consumers that power. However, very few consumers know that this insurance cost information is available to them at the dealership, and some question whether the format in which uh, NHTSA publishes the information is actually useful. Therefore, these booklets are rarely used. These are problems, and I would be more than happy to work with all of my colleagues to fix them. We all agree that regulations that are burdensome or do not serve their intended purpose should be revisited. This bill gives us that opportunity to do so. Uh, revisit a regulation that may not be meeting its intended purpose. I hope as we do this review, we do not just assume that we must throw away the idea that it is reasonable for consumers to know what type of insurance costs they will face if they buy a particular car. Uh, Madam Chair, I, Chairman, I look forward to discussing these bills. I would like to once again thank uh, our witnesses as well as uh, you for convening this hearing today. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Butterfield. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, for three minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, for the time and for your diligent work on bringing the American Manufacturing Competitive Act, uh, Competitiveness Act before the committee. Uh, I'd also like to recognize the hard work of uh, Gib Mullen, uh, Brian McCullough, Paige Anderson, and uh, Shannon Weinberg-Taylor. You know, some things in Congress aren't partisan, believe it or not, and don't need to be. And this is one of those. Uh, it's an honor to work with my colleague and friend, Congressman Lipinski, and the other members of the subcommittee on the American Manufacturing Competitive Net Competitiveness Act, I think specifically of uh, uh, Mr. Guthrie and Mr. Pompeo. Over the past several months in this committee, we've heard about the importance of creating an environment that will allow American manufacturers to thrive in a global economy. We're on the brink of a new manufacturing renaissance in this country. The only barriers that may impede this renaissance will be government created. I'm worried about the disappearing middle class, the decline of the middle class, and I think one of the biggest drivers to the decline of the middle class 
has been the disappearance of manufacturing from the United States of America. In this Congress, we've rightly talked a lot about jobs and the role government can play in creating or destroying jobs. There's no sector in our economy that's providing more highly paid and economically advantageous jobs than manufacturing. This has been true since the dawn of manufacturing at the turn of the 20th century. During an address to Congress in 1912, President Taft said that manufacturing concerns are running at their full capacity and the demand for labor was never so constant and growing. Following World War II, the United States became the world's strongest economy, and it's no coincidence that we were also the leading producer of manufacturing goods in the world. The decline of manufacturing from the 1990s until today is due in no small part to increased global competition. We must encourage an environment that will allow business to compete globally. While we may not be able to predict where the next growth sector for manufacturing will be, we should not try to implement a top-down government policy that would benefit manufacturing. We should instead insist upon a long-term strategy constructed by private sector and government leaders to focus our attention on the challenges inhibiting our global competitiveness. This is an easy but necessary step to joining together private interest uh, and public in the process of recommending how the government can make American manufacturing more efficient, more friendly, and more competitive, and we can increase the size of the American middle class by getting people back to work and bringing our overall rate of unemployment down with good, high-paying jobs. I'm excited to discuss this bipartisan legislation today, and I'm hopeful that we can work quickly to bring this legislation to a markup with broad bipartisan support. Again, I'd like to thank uh, my friend, Congressman Lipinski, and I yield back my remaining time. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Harper for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm proud to be the lead sponsor with my good friend Bill Owen of, of New York as the lead Democrat of H.R. 5859, a concise one-page bill that would repeal an obsolete mandate that costs the taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars. I welcome the witnesses today. I'm glad to have many years of automotive retailing experience with Mr. Fitzgerald and Congressman Mike Kelly from Pennsylvania on the panels. I'm also proud to have Mike as a co-sponsor to H.R. 5859. He is no doubt the voice for car dealers on Capitol Hill, and I appreciate his support on this. Since 1991, the Department of Transportation has been annually distributing by mail a document entitled Relative Collision Insurance Cost Information. This information is sent by mail to new vehicle dealers who are required to make the information available to prospective new vehicle customers upon request. NHTSA has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars distributing this booklet over the past 21 years. While this information is of value to insurance actuaries, it has been of little to no use to consumers for whom it is primarily intended. A recent survey by the National Automobile Dealers Association confirmed what we expected. Out of 800 new car dealers polled, an overwhelming 96% of the dealers answered that not a single customer has ever asked to see the booklet. I would like to note here that the information will still be available and NHTSA can still provide this information to consumers on their website. This simple and bipartisan bill, if passed, would show that Congress is serious about efforts to alleviate burdensome and unneeded regulations on businesses across this country. The President states that it is a priority of his administration to identify and eliminate costly, outdated, and unneeded regulations. And I say Congress should lead now with H.R. 5859. I'd like to thank the Chairwoman for presiding over this important hearing. Madam Chair would ask for unanimous consent to include a letter from the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers in support of H.R. 5859 in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman and the chair, and I recognize Ms. Schakowsky for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm glad that this subcommittee is holding a hearing to discuss H.R. 5865, the American Manufacturing and Competitiveness Act. President Obama has overseen the most dramatic increase in employment in the manufacturing center since, sector since the 1990s, and we must work to build upon that progress. And I want to congratulate my colleague from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, for drafting and, and pushing and, uh, and sponsoring this legislation as a means of strengthening Congress's commitment to American manufacturing. 
A strong manufacturing base is the foundation of our middle class. Good middle class jobs ensure that workers earn a living wage, that families have clothes on their back and food in their stomachs, and that their children grow up in communities with good schools and safe streets. A national manufacturing strategy will help ensure that the goods we buy are made in America and that the jobs our economy supports are American jobs. I don't share the same enthusiasm for H.R. 5859. That legislation would eliminate valuable consumer information at the point of sale because <coughs> consumers um, don't request it. Well, consumers don't request the information because they really don't know that it exists. We should not be in the practice of eliminating valuable information because we do a bad job of publicizing it. I look forward to working with my colleagues to move forward with legislation to bolster our manufacturing base and to reconsidering our actions to remove information from auto dealerships. And I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. And now we turn our attention to the panel. Uh, we will have three panels of witnesses joining us today. Each of our witnesses has prepared an opening statement that will be placed into the record. And as we all know, each will have five minutes to summarize that statement in their remarks. On our first panel, we have two of our colleagues, and we welcome you both, the Honorable Daniel Lipinski of Illinois, the Honorable Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania. Uh, they both represent states with histories deeply rooted in manufacturing. We're going to go a little bit out of order and recognize Mr. Lipinski first, just because we are considering the bills in that order. Uh, so uh, with that, Mr. Lipinski, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bonomack. I want to uh, thank you, um, uh, Ranking Member Butterfield, and uh, members of this subcommittee for holding this hearing today and for inviting me to testify. The American Manufacturing Competitiveness Act, H.R. 5865, will bring the public and private sectors together to forge an actionable bipartisan plan to revitalize Americans, America's manufacturing sector. I'd like to uh, thank my friend and colleague, Mr. Kinzinger, for working with me on this bill and co-sponsoring this bill, and uh, also thank uh, Mr. Pompeo and Chairwoman Bonomack for uh, their, uh, their work on this bill and moving it forward. Manufacturing is critical to our, for our nation. It's essential for national security so that, that we don't need to rely on other countries for our defense. Successful manufacturers provide huge numbers of jobs. Not to pick on Facebook right now while it's down, but Facebook employs about 3,000 people. Boeing employs 172,000 Americans. Wages and benefits paid in manufacturing are one-third higher than in other jobs. Plus, manufacturing has greater secondary effects in the labor market, with each job supporting five others. And as a source of two-thirds of private sector R&D, manufacturing drives high-tech innovation. When we lose manufacturing due to outsourcing, we lose the ability to create the breakthrough technologies of tomorrow. American manufacturing still has great strength and potential. It boasts the highest productivity in the world, employs 11 million people, and produces $1.7 trillion annually. Encouragingly, U.S. manufacturing employment has increased by about half a million in the last two years. But after the loss of one-third of all U.S. manufacturing jobs over the past decade, we have a long way to go. This bill will help create the domestic environment that is most conducive to America's private sector taking full advantage of our strength to grow American manufacturing. Last Congress, a similar version of this bill passed the House with very strong bipartisan support, 379 to 38. In this Congress, it has again attracted bipartisan support and backing from a variety of industry, labor, and other groups. In addition, conversations with members of the subcommittee, as well as committee staff, have resulted in numerous beneficial changes to the bill. To briefly summarize, the, the legislation creates a manufacturing competitiveness board with a strong private sector and bipartisan representation. The president will appoint the Secretary of Commerce, two state governors of different parties, and two other former or current executive branch officials. Ten private sector representatives will be appointed by House and Senate leaders, three by the majority and two by the minority in each chamber. 
the board will conduct a comprehensive analysis of the U.S. manufacturing sector, covering everything from trade issues to taxation to, two, to new markets and technologies. Based on this analysis, it will develop specific goals and specific recommendations for achieving those goals. Consolidation of government programs, regulatory reforms, improved education and training, better coordination between the public and private sectors, as well as actions taken by all levels of government, universities and stakeholders, are to be contemplated under this legislation. To promote follow-up to the strategy, the President's budget will have to state how it is consistent with the goals and recommendations of the strategy. And finally, the first strategy is to be completed in 2014 and the second in 2018. I want to be especially clear on one point. This legislation is not about the government dictating anything to the private sector. It is about bringing the public and private sectors together to form a bipartisan consensus plan for action that produces an environment for American manufacturing to flourish. America lost 6.2 million manufacturing jobs between 1998 and 2010. We must adopt smart policies that encourage innovation, entrepreneurialism, efficiency, and investment in American manufacturing. And passing this bill would be a good start. When I'm home, my constituents keep asking me, what is Washington doing to help spur job creation? This bill can be an important answer to that question. 78% of Americans favor a national manufacturing strategy, including 74% of Republicans and 78% of independents. Now, many Americans don't think Congress listens and don't think we can work together to get anything accomplished. I hope we can get this common sense bipartisan bill passed and help America's manufacturers create the jobs that we need. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Lipinski. And Mr. Kelly, welcome. You are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Bono Mack and uh, Ranking Member. Butterfield. Uh, and, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to testify. Uh, I think it's so rare uh, in uh, Washington that people that actually do what you're trying to regulate get a chance to come to the table and talk about a little bit. I, I've grown up in it. It's part of my DNA. Uh, we started our business in 1953, employ about 110 people. And uh, my, my view on H.R. 5859 is a little bit maybe different than some other folks in government uh, because dealers are actually the ones that have to provide this material. And they're under penalty of law to provide it. And there's great, there's great consequences financially if you don't. Now, when I talk about my experience, I'm talking about an automobile dealership where I actually sit on the floor. I talk to people all the time. We get somewhere between eight and 900 people a month that come into our dealerships. About 10,000 people a year come into the dealership to talk about buying a new car. Now, I've got to tell you, uh, in my years, uh, starting back in the 1967, I've never talked to one person that came through those doors that said to me, hey, by the way, Kelly, I need to look at that information on, uh, let me see, what is it, the collision, the relative collision insurance cost information. Doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. Uh, I have, uh, I made a call to the dealership when I was going to testify, and I asked our guys in the Thursday morning sales meeting, I said, do me a favor, ask our sales force if they've had this experience. Now we have over 250 years of sales experience. Not one person in that room has ever talked to a prospective owner about this booklet. Never been asked about it, never been questioned about it. Now people do want to know what it's going to cost to insure their car. And I'll tell you what, I, uh, I, I got to tell you, the answer is with the insurance agents. This is an, a, an irrelevant piece of information. Let me, let me uh, I don't know if you, you have this, I'd like to submit it to the record, the actual uh, booklet that we have to provide, uh, and I'll leave it for you, but it, it's, it's kind of interesting, uh, the booklet itself. Now, this is what it says. This table presents vehicles' collision loss experience in relative terms, with 100 representing the average for all passenger vehicles. Thus, a rating of 122 reflects a collision loss experience that is 22% higher, which means a worse cost than average, while a rating of 96 reflects a collision loss experience is 4% lower, or better than average. Now, it's unlikely that your total premium will vary more than 10%, depending on the collision loss experience of a particular vehicle. And it goes on to say, 
to obtain complete information about insurance premiums, what you need to do is contact your insurance company. Now, we were wondering about this, so the staff called NHTSA's hotline last night. And I'd like you all to mark this number down. It's 888-327-4236. Now, the representative that answered the phone has absolutely no idea about this booklet and told our staff to call your insurance agent. Now, I got to tell you, there's not a lot of things that the current administration and I agree on, but the Obama administration seems to agree with this that this provision is without merit. And their explanatory document accompanying the, their draft highway bill that was presented to the House Energy and Commerce Committee as technical assistance, it states that the data in the booklet is rarely used and not useful. The administration document also stated that a prospective buyer does not need a brochure from the federal government to obtain this information since insurance agents are trained to provide advice on how model selection affects insurance premiums. And I, I, I completely agree with the administration. Now, the other side of the coin, if the dealers don't provide this, and if somebody comes in and, and we don't have it available for them, the fine is $1,000 per occurrence with a cumulative penalty of $400,000. Now, I know those numbers don't mean anything in a town like this where we throw around money like that really doesn't matter. And, of course, it doesn't because it's not our money. It's taxpayer money. Uh, but this is a tremendous disservice to taxpayers, and it's an unnecessary burden on businesses. And, and it just is amazing to me that we actually have gotten to a point where we're having a hearing to rescind or to repeal a law that is so onerous and places a burden on job creators that they just don't need. Now, there are some people that say, well, you know what, the problem isn't that the, the material is useless. The problem is that we haven't told enough people about it. Well, we cranked out more useless pieces of paper in this town than anybody could possibly imagine. I appreciate what you're doing, Mr. Harper and Mr. Owen. This does release a burden on dealers to provide a piece of information that nobody's ever asked for, nobody needs, nobody is, was going to find a use with. It does fall on the part of the consumer. They call their insurance agent to find out what it's going to cost to insure a car. They would hardly look at this piece of, of material and come up with any idea. In fact, I'm going to leave it. I want you to all look through this. You look through this, and you please tell me after you look through it what in the world you would gain from this, what information you would gain as a buyer that would help you make a decision on what your ultimate cost of a vehicle is going to be and ownership is going to be. So, again, I thank you for the opportunity to come before you. I also uh, only been here for a year and a half. I spent all my life on the, on the floor of a dealership. So I do know a little bit of what I, I'm talking about, and, I, and I, I think that it's time to start listening to people that actually have to abide by these rules to find out what possible use this has to the American taxpayer or the American consumer. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kelly. I do not have any questions of the panelists, but I will recognize any of our colleagues who do. And Mr. I Butterfield? think I may have one or two for Mr. Lipinski. All right. We'll recognize Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. Thank you. Again, uh, Mr. Lipinski, thank you very much for your testimony today and all the hard work that you do here in, in the Congress. Uh, this isn't the first time that the Energy and Commerce Committee has taken up uh, your legislation, uh, calling on the President to prepare a national manufacturing strategy. In fact, in 2010, we reported a different version of this bill out of the full committee by a voice vote. <clears throat> and passed it on the House floor under suspension of the rules. <laughs> Obviously, efforts to promote and revitalize American manufacturing are something everyone here can get behind. We were able to work together uh, to get a bill uh, uh, through um, uh, the House before, and I'm sure we can work together to, to do it again. And so I share Mr. Lipinski's view that we must, on an ongoing basis, do a better job with strate strategic thinking and planning and to maintain the competitiveness of the U.S. manufacturing sector. This sector is vital to job creation, innovation, and even to our national security. Nonetheless, I want to acknowledge the Obama administration's increasing emphasis on the manufacturing sector. The first time we passed Mr. Lipinski's bill, we weren't aware of the many manufacturing initiatives that were bubbling up through the administration. And since that time, we have seen Congress put even more emphasis on strategic planning and policymaking related to manufacturing. Let me just share a few examples of what I'm talking about. At the end of 2009, uh, the Obama administration issued a framework 
on describing the state of manufacturing and setting out the administration's current policies and initiatives. That was year one of the Obama administration. In mid-2011, uh, President Obama's Science, Technology, and Innovation Advisors followed up with another report that prompted him to establish the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership to promote high-tech manufacturing. This past December, uh, the President created the new White House Office of Manufacturing Policy within the National Economic Council to coordinate manufacturing efforts across departments. Congress, in fiscal year 2012, uh, in the 2012 Consolidated Appropriations Act, calls for the Secretary of Commerce to establish a task force on job re repatriation and manufacturing growth. The accompanying House report requires the Secretary of Commerce to update a 2004 report on manufacturing. It also requires the Secretary to establish an Economic Security Commission to advise the Administration and Congress on long-term strategic competitive manufacturing challenges. And so we must all focus on bolstering American manufacturing uh, and that we don't squander uh, scarce government resources on efforts that are redundant. Uh, Mr. Lipinski, would you agree with me, sir, that any new efforts by Congress to promote and grow the manufacturing sector should not duplicate existing efforts? Uh, I, I certainly agree that we should not be uh, duplicating any existing efforts, and I uh, applaud the administration and uh, also uh, Congress in the past couple of years, uh, especially uh, Chairman Frank Wolf of the CJS uh, Appropriations Subcommittee had requested uh, some, uh, some reports. Uh, I, and I think we have definitely made uh, progress in focusing on manufacturing since uh, I first introduced the version of the bill in, in the last, last Congress. And one of the purposes of this bill is to try to cut down on, um, uh, on redundancy. We have a lot of redundancy already in the federal government. And uh, my intention, certainly in this bill, and I think we can work to make sure that uh, we utilize what is being done already and sort of fold that into uh, what will be done with a national manufacturing strategy. Thank you. Would you agree that any new efforts by Congress to promote and grow the manufacturing sector should try, to the extent possible, to bring together all of the different moving parts uh, that have been put in place by Congress and the White House? Would that be valuable? Yeah, we need to, and that's one of the big purposes here is to put together all these, these moving parts that have already been uh, put in place or in motion. All right. We're going to try to work together to make it happen. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. The chair now recognizes Mr. Harper for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Kelly, if I could ask you a question, and you may have had the opportunity to review the statement of Joan Claybrook, who will testify, I believe, on the third panel today. And, and I want to just read one portion of what she said and get your response to this in one of the paragraphs in her uh, opening statement. Here's what uh, is in her letter. It says, I can understand why car dealers want to keep consumers in the dark about insurance collision cost information. Dealers want to sell the cars they have on their lot. If consumers have access to information about a vehicle that might show expensive repair costs and that discourages sale, a dealer might lose a customer in a sale. How do you respond to that type of uh, an insult? Well, I, I think that most of those insults come from people who have never been in our business and don't understand the relationship between the business owner and the people that keep them alive, and that's our customers or our buyers. So anybody that I've ever been in, in, in contact with in my business is probably one of the most stable people in that community. And I tell people all the time, if you really wonder about the integrity and the, and the value of, of your car dealer, if your son played Little League Baseball, look whose name's in the outfield fence. If your daughter marched in the marching band, look who's in the program. Uh, so, I mean, it's absolutely, that's foolhardy and irresponsible to make that statement. Okay. There's absolutely no reason why anybody would want to keep anybody from knowing about the vehicle that they want to purchase. And we do provide all kind of information. But the, 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 the information we try to provide is usually relevant. Mm -hmm. and, and only, again, from people who live in some other galaxy do you get these kind of comments. When you're actually on the ground, you're face-to-face -face with people every day mm -hmm. and your ability to make, uh, make sure that the checks that you issue every two, uh, two weeks are cashable. That relationship that we have with the customer is absolutely critical. 
And so, and no, I want everybody <clears throat> to be com completely comfortable with what they buy, and so do all my dealer friends. And when you referred to the, to the, to the table, the stuff that's here for the uh, collision insurance loss, the uh, numbers that they keep, a uh, consumer is not going to look at that and gain any information. They're going to call their insurance agent, just as you said, to get the true cost of what that potential vehicle would cost. Yeah, well, well, the variables are, are great. The, yes. the, the gender, the age, you know, where you drive the car, business or pleasure, what, where you live. There's so many different variables in it. There's so there's no one size fits all. And there's no way to create a government document chart uh, that's going to tell the insurance company what they're going to be charging for that premium. Yeah, and I, I think history would would probably show that there hasn't been very many government documents that really come to the realistic uh, value of what a vehicle is. So, and and the purchasability of it. So, thank I, you, Mr. Kelly. Thank Appreciate you. it. Now yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Dr. Cassidy for five minutes. Um, my colleague, to my colleague, Mr. Lipinski, uh, I, like the, I like the general kind of, knowing that you've thought about this, I ask these questions not to challenge, but just to pick your brain. It really seems like our manufacturing right now has been driven by natural gas, the hydraulic fracturing, that sort of lowered energy cost, decreasing input cost, encouraging companies to bring their resources back to the United States. And that has actually happened quite independently of a manufacturing uh, policy. In fact, you could even argue it has happened despite the administration's efforts uh, to inhibit that. So I guess my question is, and, and again, I'm not challenging, I'm just exploring with you. Uh, my, my question is, um, if we had had an, a manufacturing policy four years ago, it seems like it would have emphasized renewable energy sources. Solyndra, for example, was an example of a, such a policy, not to knock it, but just to give an example of where the administration's emphasis was, as opposed to what happened just by market forces and by private uh, enterprise where hydraulic fracturing took place and now Dow is expanding, ExxonMobil is about to build a huge new plant, et cetera. So your, your bill, um, I guess I'm struggling to see if we see that what is happening that is good in manufacturing is a result of kind of the private sector unimpeded or despite an impediment. How would your bill add to that? So certainly uh, it makes a difference to have uh, the much cheaper natural gas here. Uh, and, that, and that certainly helps manufacturing. Uh, I wouldn't say that that has been everything that has um, helped spur the creation of uh, half million manufacturing jobs. Uh, but we're, what we're looking at here is across the board what can be done. And, and I think that the idea of having this, this board uh, with buy-in from not only whoever the administration is in, in 2014, but also from both houses of Congress, both parties, to look broadly across what can be done, energy, policy, uh, perhaps will be part of that. I would expect to be part of that. But there's a lot more to any sort of manufacturing strategy. So I think that uh, if we looked broadly at everything that, that can be done, I think we could be even further along in, uh, in promoting manufacturing, having more manufacturing jobs. But that's, that's not to say that energy policy isn't part of that. It's part of it, but it's only one, one piece of it. And then the next thing, again, not to challenge, just to explore. Um, if you look, McKinsey Quarterly will have white papers on what we need to improve manufacturing. Chamber of Commerce will. I'm sure labor unions do. Uh, institutes for tax policy. It almost seems like we know the answers out there. Uh, our tax rates are uncompetitive. We have, you know, a high debt to GDP, et cetera. How would this add to that which is available in the private sector? Well, I think we have seen a lack of having a well-coordinated policy. And a, a lot of the, these studies, uh, and there's probably a lot of truth in them, uh, but uh, we need to bring all of that together and to have action. I mean, that, that's really the key here. Uh, I think there is much more that can be done to create the, the environment for the private sector to have the best opportunity, the best incentive to uh, create more manufacturing jobs. I don't think that we have, we have done that. Uh, there have been a lot of studies, uh, but I don't think that uh, many of them have, have not been followed up on. 
uh, I believe. And this is one way to try to make sure that we put out a, a plan and encourage follow-up by Congress and by the President. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. I thank Dr. Cassidy. And with that, we thank both of our panelists for your testimony today and for doing all you can to help manufacturing in America and to create new jobs. Uh, we'll have a brief recess as we seat our second panel. And I do ask unanimous, con unanimous consent from the subcommittee to allow uh, our colleagues to sit on the dais as joyful witnesses, uh, but not participants. And uh, with, that, with unanimous consent, uh, you're welcome to join the dais. So brief, 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 brief recess as we uh, put the second panel in place, please. <clears throat> All right, on our second panel, we have uh, Zachary Model, Director of Development at Atlas Tool and Die Works. Next, we have, uh, yes, <laughs> next we have, not in this order, next we have Mark Gordon, Executive Committee Member, Manufacturing Division at the National Defense Industry Association. Also testifying is Philip Singerman, PhD, Associate uh, Director for Innovation and Industry Services at the National Institute of Standards and Technology for, at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Our fourth witness is Deborah Wint Smith, President and CEO for the Council of, on Competitiveness. Good morning, everyone. You will be recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Uh, to keep track of time, please uh, look at the lights on the timer in front of you. When it turns yellow, you have one minute left. So if you'll please make sure to turn the uh, microphone on and bring it close to your mouth so that we can all hear you clearly. And with that, we'll go ahead and, and recognize you in the order that you're seated and begin with you, Dr. Singerman, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Bono Mack, Ranking Member Butterfield, and members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to be here today to share the administration's strategy to promote growth, sustainability, and competitiveness in the manufacturing sector. We all know manufacturing matters. As President Obama has said, quote, an economy built to last demands that we keep doing everything we can to keep strengthening American manufacturing. Over the past two years, U.S. manufacturers have created nearly half a million jobs, the longest period of sustained manufacturing job growth since the 1990s. In addition, manufacturing is helping us to advance our national priorities. For example, manufacturing is a key driver of U.S. exports. In 2011, the United States exported nearly $1.3 trillion in manufacturing goods, an all-time record, which supports Secretary Bryson's goal of building it here selling it everywhere. Last summer's report on advanced manufacturing by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST, reminded us why manufacturing remains essential. Manufacturing that is based on new technologies can provide high quality, good paying jobs for American workers. Manufacturing is crucial to our balance of trade, representing 60 percent of US, U.S. exports. And manufacturing drives technological innovation accounting for 70 percent of private sector research and development. The report also made clear that the government should play an important role through the development of an innovation policy. While the United States should avoid industrial policy, we should be aggressively supporting an innovation policy that provides the best overall environment in which to do business 
and fosters the development of powerful new technologies. The report looked at a broad range of approaches to help sustain and grow the sector. In addition to research and development, the report looked at such areas as tax, trade, workforce, small business, and education, and how each helped the manufacturing sector. Today, I want to briefly highlight the importance of innovation on advanced manufacturing. In June of last year, the President called the, for the private sector to lead the formation of an advanced manufacturing partnership, whose purpose is to bring together industry, universities, and the federal government to identify emerging technologies and supportive policies that will create high-quality manufacturing jobs and enhance our global competitiveness. To complement this public-private partnership, the administration also strengthened the interagency coordination for advanced manufacturing. The Advanced Manufacturing National Program Office was established at NIST to coordinate federal agency efforts to accelerate the pace of innovation, promote technology transfer, and more rapidly integrate technology break breakthroughs into the commercial market. This interagency effort currently involves not only the Department of Commerce, but the Departments of Energy, Defense, Education, the National Science Foundation, and NASA. NIST also works in support of manufacturing through its Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program, MEP, and its Technology Partnership Office. MEP is a long-standing public-private partnership whose work leads small and mid-sized manufacturers to new sales, new product development, and market expansion. In March, the President announced a new initiative, the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, which is a proposed one-time, $1 billion federal investment to catalyze collaboration among industry, academia, to perform research and development that will accelerate innovation for advanced manufacturing, build a stronger innovation system, and link innovations more directly to domestic production capabilities. The Institutes for Manufacturing Innovation will help bridge the gap between basic research and product development, provide shared assets to help companies access cutting edge capabilities, and create an environment to train students and workers in advanced manufacturing skills. The President also announced that the administration will take immediate steps to launch a pilot institute for additive manufacturing innovation based on existing programs and funding within the Department of Defense, partnering with Energy, Commerce, NASA, and the National Science Foundation. The key to the success of these efforts is partnerships. The leverage from these partnerships enables the shared resources and creative spark needed to drive innovation here and at home. Madam Chair, in closing, let me say how much we appreciate the committee's work in support of a vibrant and dynamic manufacturing sector in the 21st century. And we look forward to working with you on legislation to further the administration's efforts to support U.S. manufacturing. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Dr. Singerman. Mr. Model, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you very much, Chairman Bonomack and Ranking Member Butterfield, members of the committee, for providing me the opportunity to speak before you today. Manufacturing is a subject very dear to my heart. I'm the fourth generation of my family since 1918 to own and operate my business, Atlas Tool and Dye Works. I work there as the Director of Development. I'm also Vice President and Co-Owner of ABET Industries as well as Accusham Inc. The businesses are located in Lyons and LaGrange, Illinois, which are sh Chicago suburbs and Representative Dan Lipinski's district. All three companies are my family's related businesses in precision manufacturing. Our companies make various parts and assemblies for the defense, aerospace, telecom, electronics, medical, industrial, and heavy machinery industries. Together we employ around 80 people. I also serve as the chairman of the TMA Government Relations Committee and vice chair of the association. TMA represents nearly 1,000 small and medium-sized manufacturers in the Midwest. We employ over 27,000 skilled workers. As an advocate of the critical importance of a healthy and growing manufacturing sector in any economy, I support passage of the American Manufacturing Competitiveness Act of 2012. One thing that strikes me about this bill is that it makes no assumptions of the best path forward to ensure America is the global manufacturing leader. That's important because there's so many diverse opinions of what the manufacturing sector needs. 
Some people fe feel unfettered free trade is a problem. Others say it's tax policy, and others say energy policy, or training and workforce development. And still, some people say the industry is strong and nothing is needed. With these varying opinions, all from purported experts, it's very difficult to develop a path forward. Instead, this bill creates a system to thoughtfully and methodically evaluate the issues surrounding the industry, and it outlines a framework to develop a plan for success. As a business owner, I know that planning is critical. Plan, execute, and review. That's the basic core of any good business model. Unfortunately, when an organization doesn't operate with a plan, what happens is a plan to fail. Right now, the United States is operating with a plan to fail in the world economy when it comes to manufacturing, and that's unacceptable for a global superpower. We simply must be the world leader in manufacturing. And why is that so important? Manufacturing is a keystone industry in any economy. Most economists agree that for every sales dollar in manufacturing, there are two to three dollars of supporting activities required. This is the highest multiplier effect of any industry. In addition, manufacturing creates good jobs that value skills, jobs with healthy benefits, and jobs where you can find a lifelong career. Manufacturing is critical to national defense as well as product innovation. Finally, manufacturing is one of the fastest growing sectors in the world economy. It requires capital investments in land and equipment. It requires many factors of production. And in short, it's simply one of the fastest ways to jumpstart employment, investment, and innovation. Many other countries realize these facts. They are constantly and actively working to court manufacturers to locate within their borders. We live in a world with many competitors, and they look at our position with envy. They're working to surpass the United States in many areas. And if we ignore what they're doing and neglect to make our own plans, I assure you those competitors will succeed. Countries like China, Russia, Brazil, Canada, the UK, and many others have a clear and detailed national manufacturing strategy. They have decided what critical industries they want within their borders and are actively working to foster success. They're asking the questions, what can we help you do to be more competitive? How can we help you sell more product and create more jobs? Whether it's consideration of a VAT versus an income tax, adding or removing tariffs and import barriers, providing regulatory relief, requiring domestic production, or even low-cost loan and financing programs, these countries are working in a concentrated and organized effort towards success. Furthermore, many of these countries already have developed best practices when it comes to supporting their manufacturing sectors. The American Manufacturing Competitiveness Act will not only bring the U.S. into line with our competitors, but compel us to study and learn from them. And this type of benchmarking is a standard best practice management technique. Ultimately, the success of any industry depends on many factors. However, our collective will to ensure and achieve success is probably the most important factor. The American Manufacturing Competitiveness Act and ultimately the National Manufacturing Competitiveness Strategy developed in Section D of that act are important first steps to the long-term health and success of our overall economy. I applaud Congressman Lipinski, Congressman Kinzinger for their leadership and, uh, to develop and sponsor this bill, and I urge you all to pass this bill in committee and ultimately the full House. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Model and Mr. Gordon. With that, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, Madam Chairman Bono Mack, Ranking Member Butterfield, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, my name is Mark Gordon, Director of Defense Programs at the National Center for Advanced Technologies and a member of the Manufacturing Division at the National Defense Industrial Association. On behalf of the 1,700 corporate members and almost 100,000 individual members, I'm pleased to uh, appear before the subcommittee today to, to, talk, to discuss the need for a competitiveness strategy to successfully develop a national ecosystem supporting American manufacturing. There should be no doubt as to the importance of the manufacturing sector to the economic and national security of the U.S. We have already heard us an impressive uh, um, number of statistics uh, from multiple speakers. Most importantly, manufacturing means stable, high-paying jobs for millions of U.S. taxpayers, and these jobs depend directly on the current and future competitiveness of the U.S. manufacturing sector in comparison to our trading partners. Trading partners which possess national manufacturing strategies which aim to boost their competitiveness. While the U.S. is competitive in manufacturing today, our essential goal should be to increase our competitiveness to ensure future growth in an increasingly aggressive global environment. There are many recently published strategic plans, studies, reports, and roadmaps 
on U.S. manufacturing, also all which focus recommendations on structural barriers, emerging technologies, infrastructure partnering, or economic preservation models as vital components that lead to the revitalizing, reshoring, or expanding of the U.S. manufacturing uh, capability. My position is that developing a competitive manufacturing sector requires establishing and maintaining a national manufacturing ecosystem that simultaneously addresses structural limitation, such as export control regulations, public and private R&D investments, such as advanced materials or processing and fabrication needs, and bridging the gap to successful scale-up and commercialization. Given the multitude of existing recommendations and strategies, what is required is a balanced approach that sets priorities among these mechanisms with a single goal of competitive American manufacturing ecosystem, an ecosystem that proves fertile enough to grow and retain uh, domestic manufacturing capacity. Turning to the specific issue of national security, Under Secretary of Defense Frank Kendall stated er earlier this year that essentially the industrial base is part of our force structure and we have to treat it like it is. Acknowledging the vital role of defense manufacturing and the requirement to actively manage its capabilities, the 2012 defense guidance clearly defines strategies built upon exploiting our technological advantage, such as advanced electronics, um, lightweight materials, and reduced size, weight, and power for a broad range of defense systems. The DOD recognizes that these technological advances are realized through manufacturing technologies, which is why the uh, 13 defense budget highlights advanced manufacturing as a top priority, along with cyber and autonomous systems. However, this strategy or this priority is set, with, is set within a reduced budget environment with pressures on acquisition costs that will defer modernization and increase sustainment requirements. Acquisition and sustainment are both supported by the same industrial base, um, which is threatened by these reductions. This defense industrial base, which is at the lower tiers, is predominantly small and medium-sized with commercial and defense companies, possesses a variety of specialized manufacturing capabilities required to produce and sustain defense systems, and must be managed to ensure readiness and avoid obsolescence. A defense industrial base that is technologically vibrant, highly capable, and financially fit is in the national interest. And as such, the Defense Department is unique beneficiary of a highly competitive manufacturing base because of the reinforcing nature of an economic, healthy manufacturing ecosystem on this shared industrial base. Our endorsement of this bill is based upon a stated objectives, board membership and duties, and a lengthy list of topics to be considered during the comprehensive analysis and strategy development. However, we note that the comprehensive analysis under Section 4, Paragraph C uh, would seem to require considerable effort and no staff, budget, or board support is currently specified. Obviously, resources will be required commensurate with the expected level of effort and not be left to the private or public uh, service uh, board members. I'm honored to have had this opportunity to provide you with a defense industry perspective on the importance of developing the needed uh, ecosystem. And speaking of, on behalf of NDI membership, I thank you all for actively supporting U.S. manufacturing policies. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Ms. Wynne-Smith, welcome back to our committee. It's a pleasure to have you here again, and we're recognizing you for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Bono Mack, Ranking Member Butterfield, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to discuss Representative Lipinski's bill to promote the competitiveness of American manufacturing in the global economy. The Council on Competitiveness is a 25-year-old nonprofit, nonpartisan organization uniquely comprised of CEOs, labor leaders, and university presidents, all working together to ensure U.S. prosperity. Under the leadership of our chairman, Sam Allen, the chairman and CEO of Deer & Company, the Council is undertaking a multi-year U.S. manufacturing competitiveness initiative. Last December, we released a national manufacturing strategy called Make an American Manufacturing Movement. We address the key issues around talent, technology, investment, and infrastructure to develop this action agenda. We are certain that the committee will find this comprehensive strategy useful in its efforts to support America's manufacturing future. We know manufacturing is a cornerstone of American independence, economic prosperity, and national security. 
The image of manufacturing as dumb, dirty, dangerous, and disappearing is obsolete. Today, manufacturing is smart, safe, sustainable, and surging. It is inextricably linked to America's innovation capacity and a driving force leading our technological transformation from high-performance computing, modeling and simulation tools in an exascale economy, to materials by design, advanced robotics, sensors, smart automation, and the new additive manufacturing revolution well underway. And manufacturing is broader. It's more deeply integrated with services and has a higher multiplier effect on the economy than at any time in history. The manufacturing enterprise includes research, development, production, sales, distribution, logistics, customer service, marketing, and support. In short, manufacturing is a full life cycle system extending from the making of physical products to the delivery of premium services. Understanding the full life cycle of production from startup to scale up is essential if we are going to enact policies that will ensure the United States long-term success. The Council applauds the increased public and political attention given to manufacturing. America's economic portfolio requires a healthy and growing manufacturing sector, sector to tackle the grand macroeconomic problems facing our country, from job creation, sustaining our middle class, debt reduction, entitlement reform, to infrastructure investment for the future. We urge Congress and the President to develop and implement a national manufacturing strategy that unleashes America's manufacturing potential in a time of great transformation. And we are pleased that the American Manufacturing Competitiveness Act of 2012 is progressing through the House. Supporting America's manufacturing future does not mean an industrial policy of selecting favorite sectors or firms, subsidizing decaying industries, or adopting protectionist policies that inhibit fair global competition and trade. These tactics rarely prove effective. Instead, the government should focus on creating the right conditions for manufacturing to thrive. This is an imperative given the changing dynamic of global competition and the steady rise of state-supported capitalism, coupled to predatory mercantilist trade policies and targeted intellectual property theft and pervasive cyber threats against our digital networks. In this global knowledge-intensive economy, the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing has never been more uncertain or more important, and so the policy prescriptions must be right. America's economy needs accelerated productivity, faster economic growth. Our security requires a deeper, more resilient industrial base, and our private sector is deployed and prepared to produce solutions to meet national and global challenges in energy security, health, environment, food security, and as I mentioned, pervasive threats to cyber networks. Our global economic competitors are aggressively developing and implementing robust national manufacturing strategies. They're targeting high value investment, they're targeting advanced production, and building skilled workforces. Today's hearing is one of many critical steps Congress can take to keep America competitive in global manufacturing. This bill lays the groundwork and process for creating a national manufacturing strategy and for developing and expanding the essential nonpartisan public-private partnerships. The Council hopes this committee and the full committee will continue to work in a bipartisan fashion to move this bill forward through the legislative process. Americans have always been pioneers, we're risk takers, and we're makers. Our task is to create the enabling conditions for 21st century innovation and production in scale in America. We must establish a business environment and nurture and grow the ecosystem that fosters breakthrough innovations, rapid commercialization, and allows firms, both small and large, to succeed in the global economy. The Council stands ready to work with you to set in place the policies needed to ignite a new era of, and of competitive and sustainable manufacturing. Thank you for this opportunity to be before you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Wynne Smith, and that I, the Chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for questions, and I will uh, direct my first question to Mr. Model. Uh, as we all know that there was a jobs report released today and unemployment rose to 8.2 percent as the sluggish economy added only 69,000 new jobs, which was the fewest number in a year. These are uh, dismal 
uh, reporting numbers. Uh, but can you speak to, uh, you're a fourth generation family owned and operated business. What do you see as the biggest threats to your ability to compete? Well, related to the uh, employment number, I, I can say I, I personally had a 10% employment growth last month, so we hired uh, eight new people. But um, in terms of, of, of that issue, we have a very hard time finding skilled and trained workers right now. Um, we're busy, and we have growing demand, and, and I'm just having a very hard time hiring people who have the skills to work. Now, I think if, if uh, we had this um, act in place, maybe some of those issues would have come out and we would have some policy addressing that issue. Um, the other, other problem that I see as a manufacturer, you know, having many, many years in business, is that um, we talked about the defense space. About 30, 40 percent of our business is defense. Um, the other large portion of that is commercial. And any small business will tell you that they probably have two or three key customers, and without those customers, they really couldn't operate. I've seen a lot of my larger key customers leave, largely leave the country, probably due to predatory trade policies where they can, you know, assemble products a lot cheaper elsewhere. Now, that's my personal opinion, but in terms of how does that affect the defense base, well, as I lose my large key customers, I'm more dependent on the, defen the defense work or the remaining work that's here. I'm less competitive serving that because my capacity is not just shared over, def you know, uh, commercial work as well as defense work. It's, it's now more, more defense related. Um, so it makes me less competitive, and uh, you know all of these issues together, I think, are things that would come out if you had a national strategy act to look at this and develop policy around that. Well, can you speak to specific changes in U.S. policies that you'd like to see implemented that well, would help yeah, improve the environment? For yeah, specifically, you know, there are some trade issues. I'm a free market, um, you know, advocate myself, but I think as we integrate into uh, a global economy where there's a lot more planning going on. And uh, in, in other economies, and we're trading with people like that, we need to figure out how to address that and how to keep our sectors competitive with that. Um, specifically, tax policy. You know, we, we don't all have the most competitive tax policy here in the U.S. for manufacturers who want to export. From my perspective, we trade with a lot of countries who have adopted a VAT tax in favor of a lower corporate or eliminated corporate income tax. If you look at that, in another light, not in manufacturing, you might not like that policy, but if you look at that in terms of manufacturing and exporting and creating jobs, companies that export get that VAT tax refunded to them, whereas U.S. companies have their income tax and all their taxes built right in the cost of the product, so it makes it less competitive when you export it. So some of these policies, if you look at it in the light of manufacturing, look a lot different. Thank you. Ms. Winsmith, uh, the legislation before us tries to avoid creating a new government bureaucracy by relying heavily on input from the private sector, which is intended to include the full range of non-governmental organizations and nonprofits. It also tasks the board with looking at ways to streamline government processes or cut back on unnecessary regulation. Can you uh, agree with that approach? Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yes, I think that uh, is one of the very uh, positive um, elements in the, in the proposed legislation because um, the bill recognizes the full panoply of private sector leadership that's required to really develop and enact a national strategy that is a systems integration effort. So I think the uh, types of expertise identified in the legislation is right on. In terms of not duplicating and ensuring uh, a smooth functioning bureaucracy, we are making a lot of progress in integrating manufacturing in the administration, and I certainly want to applaud the efforts of the administration to do that. However, we can do a better job on that, and I think that this uh, national strategy will be one more step with congressional involvement to encourage that. The defense sector is a huge leader in what we're talking about, and yet defense, because of its um, imperative for national security, really, I think, is not fully utilized in the transformation. At the end of the day, this manufacturing need is a huge national security initiative. Thank you. I'm going to yield back my last 20 seconds and recognize Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. Thank you. Dr. Singerman, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I understand that there are a number of initiatives underway uh, as a result of President Obama's uh, intense focus on manufacturing. Uh, this includes initiatives that are underway uh, at the White House and uh, some through the Department of Commerce and some in other places of the executive branch. As you might be aware, this isn't the first time uh, we have considered Mr. Lipinski's bill uh, in the last Congress on a bipartisan basis. 
we reported a different version of his bill out of this committee and passed it through the House, uh, but it never made, made it through the other body. Uh, at that time, we really weren't aware of all of the things that you guys are doing in the executive branch uh, to, uh, related to manufacturing, and uh, now we know. And since that time, we also have seen Congress push through its own ideas to put more emphasis on planning and policymaking related to, to manufacturing. I believe that, um, let me just skip to the question, given what you know about current efforts to bolster manufacturing, can you please share with us your thoughts about how we can make uh, H.R. 5865 an effective and useful addition to what the Commerce Department and the administration uh, already have underway? Uh, thank you, Mr. Butterfield, yeah. for that question. Um, let me say that uh, I generally concur with the sentiments that have been expressed by the committee and uh, my colleagues on the panel and uh, Mr. Lipinski about his, uh, about his legislation, the importance of manufacturing to the nation's innovation ecosystem and to our global competitiveness, and the importance of a national strategy, not a federal strategy, but a national strategy, in support of advanced manufacturing to, adv to identify public and private investments and policies to support that. Uh, we've been working with uh, Representative Lipinski's staff, uh, have had conversations with them about this legislation, and we would be, we are delighted to work with the committee as you consider this bill. Uh, I, th I think a number of the members of the subcommittee raised uh, questions about coordination and the, uh, the uh, chairwoman raised a question about duplication and bureaucracy. These are issues that I think the committee will uh, consider uh, as it uh, addresses this legislation moving forward. What are examples of times when the Commerce Department, or more specifically the National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, work closely with the private uh, sector? Uh, that's a very, it's a very good question. Uh, we um, have um, a visiting committee on advanced technology, which is composed of leaders uh, from the academic and industrial sectors. Uh, it's a federal uh, advisory committee, so it is a public, uh, a public body. Uh, it's a very high-level body, uh, and it provides uh, advice to the, uh, the undersecretary of, uh, of uh, Commerce for Standards, uh, Patrick Gallagher, uh, and his management of the organization. Uh, this Congress and the American Competes Act uh, created, um, uh, directed two studies, uh, one by the uh, Department of Commerce uh, on innovation and competitiveness capacity. Uh, NIST was closely involved in supporting that, and that, that study was overseen by an external advisory board. Uh, we are also supporting, as uh, I indicated in my testimony, the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, which is a private sector-led industry an academic uh, group of leading research, research universities and global companies uh, to provide guidance to the administration on the development of policy. There are several other examples, but uh, those are just a few that... So you clearly have. recognize uh, the private sector as a stakeholder in this process? Absolutely. And you do that enthusiastically? Yes. I would also yes. add the, um, the Manufacturing Extension Partnerships Advisory Committee, also a federal advisory committee, which focuses on the needs of small and mid-sized manufacturing firms, again populated by private sector individuals uh, from community colleges, uh, industry, and, and professional societies. So this is really a theme of the administration, reaching out to the, uh, the private sector to provide guidance to our activities. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Blackburn, recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. And Dr. Singerman, I want to stay with you for just a minute on that because you testified that government should avoid industrial policy and making bets on particular companies and industries and should invest in innovation policy to create the best overall business environment. Now, I agree with you. I think that picking winners and losers is a very bad idea, and frankly, this administration just really hasn't been very good at it. When you look at what has happened with Solyndra and Beacon Power and Inner One, all um, casualties, if you will, of the DOE loan program, and that trying to get in here and uh, manipulate and pick those winners and losers. So the track record there isn't very good. Um, 
And the purpose of the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership that you were just mentioning is to bring together industry, universities, and the federal government to invest in emerging technologies. Am I saying this right? Uh, yes, that was my okay. testimony. And so the purpose, they will invest in these that will create high quality manufacturing jobs. So my question to you is this, is that not picking winners and losers in terms of which technologies that you're going to back? So that's a very important question and obviously a question that uh, has... I think the differentiation is very important. Uh, it's a very important question and a very important differentiation. And the, uh, the focus of the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, and I would also say the uh, efforts that we're involved in at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies are, are not focused on funding individual companies. We recognize that one needs a, as I think other members of this panel have, have mentioned, a balanced and comprehensive approach that looks at trade, Okay, then let's, let me come at it like this with you. Okay, what are the emerging technologies that you are wanting to go for? So, and then who gets to decide what those technologies are going to be? Whose decision is it to pick out and say, all right, we're going to go invest in this technology and not that? Because when in this committee we look at the issue of energy, the picking winners and losers and trying to go after wind and solar and not in all of the above hasn't, uh, hasn't fared very well. So what's the criteria that they're going to base this on and who are going to be the elites that make the decision of what wins and what loses? See, I like competitiveness and I like the marketplace making these decisions rather than a group of people that have been self-identified as being pros in this and uh, thinking that they're going to self-vet their opinions and arrive at a decision. So I got a little bit of a problem with that one. Let me move on. I've got just a minute and a half left. I want to talk a little bit about information technology and piracy. In my area in Tennessee, we have a lot of auto manufacturing. We have financial service applications, health care, uh, entertainment that are all dealing with this. So when you look at the issue of competitiveness as far as it relates to intellectual uh, information technology inputs and IP protections. I want to know what any of you are doing that we can quickly state and then if Department of Commerce and uh, the FTC has been helpful or has not been helpful. Anyone want to respond? Ms. Wint Smith, go ahead. Thank you, um, Congresswoman Blackburn. I, I think this issue of protecting and dealing with the cyber infrastructure is at the top of the list because okay. Virtually every private sector and government network is being consistently targeted by adversaries and some even, I think, of our trading partners. We have to have an integrated strategy for this and actually the enabling technologies that enable us to both protect and ensure that these cyber networks okay. are operational because everything depends on their resiliency and performance. So it's a huge priority for our country. Okay. Thank you. Any addition to that? No, okay. Uh, Mr. Model, I'll just say manufacturing added only 12,000 jobs this past month, so I'm glad to know where 800 of those jobs were added. So it looks like you were the winner in the month. Uh, quickly, do you think this administration's economic policies are helping or failing you? Anyone want to answer? Okay, go ahead. Well, I would, uh, it was eight jobs, but I wish it was 800. But eight. eight. I okay, I thought you said, I'm, I misheard you, so but we'll edited. correct that record. Um, the, uh, you know, related to the administration's efforts on, and, and what you talked about picking winners and losers, you know, I think we have to have a good overall policy, like we talked about, a good competitive policy. But in, a, in, in addition to picking winners and losers, I, I think our, our, our competitors are doing that. And, and maybe I would argue that what happened with Solyndra and with those industries was, was that we did not do a good enough job supporting them. I would say that, you know, some of our trading partners... I, I would probably take issue with that, and my time has expired. So I thank you for the answer. I think the gentlelady in the chair now recognizes Mr. Gonzalez for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is my biggest fear, and I would be supportive of this bill because obviously 
uh, I was supportive of its, its last version and such. The issue I take is simply is I actually see that we're ignoring things that are systemic, that took over a number of years to develop in this country, and we're facing the consequences now. My problem is we can have another commission, we can have another board, but we're all, both Congress and the private sector, are whistling past the graveyard. Let me give you my take on things, and I'm going to be quoting from different articles over a period of time. This is from uh, the Hamilton Project. It was cited in an, an article in the Post uh, on January 19, 2012. From 2001 to 2007, investment in equipment and software, the kinds of investment that boost productivity and create good jobs, declined 15 percent as a share of our GDP. Something's been happening out there. Where is our GDP? Where do we invest our money? The combined assets of conventional banks and so-called shadow banking systems grew from a mere $500 billion in 1970 to $30 trillion in 2008. In the 1970s to the 80s, financial firms comprised 15% of all corporate profits. By 2006, it was up to 33%. Financial services gradually comprised nearly 62% of GDP. You better figure out where that money is being invested. What we want in the greatest return. Be honest with you, I don't even know where my 401 is being invested. If I was a teacher, I don't know where my pension. But I guarantee you, it's going to be usually in the highest yielding uh, products out there which generally do not create jobs in the United States of America. We're not doing anything about it. And, and I know, and maybe this is one way that we can bring people together and, and address it. This is uh, Harold Meyerson way back on January 5th, 2011 in the Post. Uh, but there is a way to look at the recession, that it's institutional, that it's a consequence of the decisions by leading banks and corporations to stop investing in job-creating enterprises that were key to a broadly shared prosperity. The share of profits of United States-based multinationals that came from their foreign affiliates had increased from 17% in 1977 and 27% in 1994 to nearly 50% in 2006. This is uh, Noriel Rubini in a Post article of September 17, 2010. 2010. Most policy approaches, including the Obama proposals, have tended to subsidize the demand for capital rather than the demand for labor. That has the problem backwards. In the second quarter of 2010, capital spending reached an annual growth rate of 25 percent. The argument that increased demand for capital leads to greater demand for labor, that is, if you buy more machines, you need workers to run them, has not held up. Firms are invested in capital goods, equipment, and offshore offices that allow them to produce the same amount of goods with less and lower labor cost. We exceed all other countries in productivity. We do more with less, and with the recession, obviously that may have been needed, but we've reached the breaking point. To avoid a chronic increase in the unemployment rate, we need to subsidize the demand for labor, achieving job creation, rather than making it cheaper to buy capital as investment and other tax credits would do. And that is a focused approach. It goes back to what Mer Butterfield was saying about preparing a workforce to be globally competent in products and services that are produced in this country, that can be consumed in this country as well as exported. We are not doing much of that. And I thank you for your testimony today. And obviously, I'm using my five minutes to basically set out there what we are all ignoring, both in the private and public sector. And until we come to grips, what got us to where we are today, we're not going to undo it. I have 30 seconds, but I do want to ask, Mr. is it model? Is that the way you pronounce that? How were you able to hire eight additional folks? What were the contracts, the nature of the contracts? I'm real curious about that. Well, uh, primarily we're hiring in uh, machining uh, and turning departments for programming, CNC programming, and these are highly skilled, highly technical positions. Um, I've had to increase wages. You know, we were initially advertising around $20 an hour. We were hiring people at $25 and $26 an hour. And we were stealing people from other companies because there just, quite frankly, is not a trained labor pool out there. So that's, that's how I was able to find those people. And where is this demand 
emanating? I mean, in other words, the contracts are coming. Is it the work private or is it government, local, state? Um, defense work has driven a lot of my growth right now. Um, my uh, telecom business has been shrinking, and uh, we've looked for other markets. It's been defense. Also, some of our industrial products and our heavy equipment, we do a lot of work for Caterpillar, and, and that's been growing. But uh, it's been defense, some heavy equipment, and then some general industrial products for export. All right. Thank you very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank the gentleman. At this time, Mr. Harper is recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank each of you uh, uh, for being here today and uh, giving us some insight in, into uh, what's going on in the manufacturing world. Uh, Mr. Bonnell, I have a, a couple of questions I'd like to ask you, if I may. Uh, if, if we benchmark our manufacturing environment and capabilities against our uh, our closest competitors, let's say, in other countries, whether that's Germany or China or Japan or others. Uh, if you were to line those, where would you expect to see the biggest differences between us and those competing, uh, competitors? Yeah, I would, I would say it's definitely going to be in tax policy. It's going to be in education and training. Uh, um, you know, in Germany, they do a lot more vocational training, which is given legitimacy along the lines of a college degree. I'd love to see that here. Um, also, in terms of trade and uh, whether it's uh, supporting exports or protecting industries that you want to see, I think other countries take a closer look at that. Okay. What are some of the issues that you see or think of as a manufacturer that, uh, that of those issues, how would you implement those or make them part of the core of our national uh, strategy, uh, particularly on the education issue? I, I'm certainly intrigued by uh, by that and how we can implement that here. And we're seeing it some, uh, particularly in my home state of uh, Mississippi, that a lot of the community colleges are taking that uh, approach uh, for job training, uh, and we're seeing that. Anything along those lines that you might see? Yeah, in, in Illinois, there's a lot of community colleges doing this as well. Um, my, my association, TMA, also has taken a lead role. We've had a historical um, you know, leg up in this training. Um, they've been training since the 1920s. We work with some of the MEPs. I've seen some great things out of those programs. But again, there's a fractured, there's a lot of different groups doing this, and there's no one really comprehensively bringing those programs and policies together and saying, this is the best practice. We're going to go with, with this program because it's really worked. Okay. Madam Chair, in light of the uh, time restraints, I'll yield back. The gentleman yells back. At this time, Mr. Sarbanes is recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to ask um, Dr. Singerman a question about the scouting, supply scouting program inside uh, NIST. And before I ask you the question, I just want to read a little bit about it to the committee and to anyone who's not aware of it because it's a great success. And I want to ask some follow-up questions about how we may be able to expand it. So within NIST, you have the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which is an attempt to uh, work with uh, manufacturers all across the country, support their efforts to network and make connections and get real um, concrete opportunities. The supplier scouting, which is part of the MEP's Make It in America initiative, has worked to streamline federal agency contracting with small and medium U.S. manufacturers. The program does this by connecting manufacturers with the procurement offices of various federal agencies and assisting in the expansion and development of the manufacturer's product offerings to respond to the government's evolving contracting needs. The program has been a great success, helping to ensure federal agencies such as DOE, DOD, and DOT comply with the various Buy American statutes while simultaneously bolstering the U.S. manufacturing base. For example, in the case of the Department of Energy, of the 83 Buy American waivers filed by the agency suggesting that there were no U.S. manufacturers to supply their contracting needs, the supplier scouting program was able to identify 39 matches between U.S. manufacturers and the Department of Energy, representing a 47 percent success rate. Subsequently, 65 different U.S. manufacturers received business from the federal government. This is business that would otherwise have been shipped uh, overseas. And there's other examples of the success. But let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. 
has there been interest from um, other agencies in entering into the supplier scouting partnerships similar to that of the Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, um, or Department of Defense? Are you aware of that? Uh, let me answer that by just adding some um, some context to to your question yeah. for for the uh, for the committee. The uh, the manufacturing extension partnership program has been in existence for nearly two decades. It is a public private federal local program in which uh, the federal government provides a third of the funding, the private sector provides a third of the funding, and state and local governments provide another third of the funding. Every state has a center. Some states have more than one center. These are typically not these are nonprofit, often university affiliated organizations. These are not federal federal employees or federal organizations. The federal government is a partner with local organizations. And in the sixty centers with over four hundred locations in every state, there are approximately fourteen hundred experts, generally from manufacturing backgrounds who have expertise in various areas of specialty and know their industries and their communities. And it's through this national network that suppliers are identified for opportunities that the federal government and increasingly the private sector have where they need suppliers, small and mid-sized firms, but it, uh, are unable to find them. Uh, we've uh, started to work closely with the Small Business Administration, which has a complementary program working with the private sector. Uh, Representative Sarbanes, uh, you mentioned the Department of Transportation. That's been a highly successful program, uh, particularly in the area of high-speed rail, uh, a, a, a sector that this country has not been a leader in in the past. And there was a perception that there were no small firms that could supply material uh, for the, uh, the the large construction programs. The MBP program organized well-attended hundreds of small firms uh, at meetings on the West Coast in Chicago and most recently in Florida and has made numerous connections, actual deals, product sales for small firms working with the federal agencies and through those the federal agencies contracting through large companies to build high-speed rail. So it's been an extraordinarily successful program. I'm, I'm running out of time, but first of all, I wanted to uh, say that I think that Congressman Lipinski's bill is a terrific opportunity to focus us uh, generally on these manufacturing issues, but programs like the Supplier Scouting Program can really help to bolster that focus. Are there plans to make sure that there's, there's continued support financially within the MEP budget so, for the Supplier Scouting Program? So the, the MEP program has seeded, the pro seeded these efforts, but um, we have relied upon um, contracts, if you will, or interagency agreements with the Department of Transportation, Defense Logistics Agency, Department of Energy, to fund the additional effort that's required on a really a one-to-one, -one, boots on the ground basis to identify those firms that have the capability or could develop the capability to provide the products and services to, the, in, uh, to these federal agencies and increasingly to private companies. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes Mr. Kinzinger for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. And again, uh, thank you for uh, to all the witnesses for coming in. I really appreciate it. Uh, the manufacturing sector has received a uh, obviously a lot of attention recently, uh, but it hasn't always been a focus. I think specifically, you know, 10, 20 years ago, uh, I remember hearing members of, of, uh, of government saying that, in essence, manufacturing was out of vogue, and uh, we've moved beyond a manufacturing economy. One portion of this bill that I think is important is it puts in place a presidentially confirmed group of private sector and government experts that will focus our attention on manufacturing for two distinct presidential terms. Uh, do each of you believe raising the stakes in the creation of a board that delivers recommendations to Congress do you believe it will lead to a greater consensus on policies or actions that will improve the environment for American manufacturing? And we'll start with you, ma'am. I think it will if it's comprehensive. And you just mentioned, um, Congressman, that manufacturing itself needs the new definition. It's far broader than the making of something. It's this whole complex supply system, the marketing, all of that. If we can address all those issues and ensure that Treasury and justice 
and other agencies in our government that have such an impact on policy are part of this, it will be very successful. And, and I think that's a good point. I mean, the reality is, is manufacturing is not a, not a thing. It's not a, it, it's an idea. And to really get a grip on the idea and all the ancillary parts of it and everything that's involved, I think to have people committed to sitting around and having a discussion or a talk about the big picture and how are we going to put our arms around the big picture and every facet of it is better than really kind of muddling through in a uh, you know piecemeal kind of basis. Mr. Gordon? I'd absolutely agree with that. In fact, uh, in the Defense Department, one of the things that Congress has already done in the uh, NDAA from 11 is to establish a manufacturing and industrial-based policy instead of just an industrial policy. It was manufacturing and industrial-based policy, essentially moving um, the organization responsible for manufacturing within DOD up four levels, much higher than the Secretary, much higher to the Secretary of Defense. Um, in addition to this, uh, you've already heard what I talked about in terms of advanced manufacturing now being one of the top three priorities for R&D, and uh, the, uh, the department's S2T2, which is a sector by sector and technology by technology study of what needs to happen in the industrial base. And I'd hate to see us in a position where we're someday having to buy dumbed down equipment from other places to defend ourselves against potentially anybody. So, uh, Mr. Model, welcome from Illinois, Thank land you. of Lincoln. Thank you. Yes, great, great state. Um, I, would, I would agree with what was said before, and I think the key is, is sustaining things. You know, success doesn't happen when you kind of pop in with an idea and then disappear. You need to sustain it. And then the other end of it is action. You know, a lot of these recommendations come out of a lot of groups. I'm hoping that this, like we said, a comprehensive formal approach will actually lead to legislative action to solve some of the problems, because there's plenty of reports out there right now, but haven't all come together and, and action has not occurred. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Dr. Singerman. Turn your microphone on. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I would only add that I think it's important, as, as has been mentioned by the members of the uh, subcommittee, uh, for the private sector to be closely engaged and leading this, this effort, working with the uh, public officials at the federal and state level. And I saw that the Chicago area factory output fell to a two and a half year low in May, uh, showing signs of a slowing economy in Illinois. I would argue it's because many of Illinois' government policies are very unfriendly to surrounding states. And just like the United States needs to compete with other countries in the world, Illinois needs to compete, and unfortunately some of our leadership has not gotten that message. The state of Illinois is burdened by insurmountable debt that I believe is inhibiting manufacturing growth. In our legislation, we include two governors selected by both parties as members of the board. Can each of you speak a little bit, and, and actually very briefly, I got about 50 seconds, about the importance of the role of state governments in fostering environment for manufacturing and growth? And we'll start with you, Dr. Singer. And I would like to speak to that, because we, we at the uh, Department of Commerce and NIST view the role of states as crucial in uh, developing a national strategy for manufacturing resurgence. And although uh, we agree that the federal government should not have an industrial policy, I agree with uh, Representative Blackburn, um, states all have industrial policies. Every state picks winners and losers. Uh, every, uh, the states that I've been affiliated with, Pennsylvania and Maryland, and knowledgeable about other states as well, they all have very concrete programs to invest in particular companies or loan dollars to particular companies. What the federal government can do uniquely that states cannot do Thanks. is provide the context and the uh, R&D funding at a high level through the National Science Foundation, through NIST right. and other agencies okay. to Thank provide you. the basis for the states. Thank you. And, and just if I, could, if I may, just very briefly, Mr. Model, if you want to address. Yeah. Well, for example, workers' comp in Illinois is, is a huge problem compared to our neighbors. It's $1,000 per employee for me in Illinois. In Indiana, it would be $400 per employee for my same coverage. So. And you're not the only one I hear that from. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I yield back. I think the gentleman in the chair now recognizes Mr. Rush for five minutes. Madam Chairman, and I want to thank the ranking member, Mr. Butterfield, for holding a hearing on these important matters. My question is about HR 5865. The world today looks like a wide open field in the midst of a high stakes economic marathon as front runners other countries are trying to serve surpass the US. <clears throat> it was predicted that this year or this past year, twenty eleven, the US manufacturing industry 
uh, and then see that our nation has dominated, is on a path to finish uh, this economic marathon in second place after China. I certainly hope that this is not the case. And <clears throat> but I also feel as, a, as though unless we change course now, it's probably going to be true. In the same token, the political unrest and turmoil that we are witnessing overseas and even in our own country is clear evidence that job creation is a top priority for all of us. And I understand that the bill that we're considering is a bipartisan bill, and I hope, Madam Chair, that in the rewrite of this bill that <coughs> you've engaged with both sides of the aisle to make all the changes that I've seen on this bill as we did when we adopted H.R. 4962 during the last Congress. America's manufacturing sector is an important and essential foundation for the future of our country. Consider the fact that in 2009, the manufacturing sector employed more than 11.5 million people. But the surprising <coughs> thing about this is, although it is, was significant, uh, when you consider that our nation actually lost 5.8 million jobs between 1999 and 2000, then that certainly kind of balances our enthusiasm. And I agree that our, uh, with my colleagues on the other side, that we live in a very competitive economic environment that requires an aggressive, multifaceted, multifaceted policy agenda to bring our <coughs> industry back to where it was before the recession. What I disagree on is uh, on the methodology that will lead us to our global uh, <coughs> competitive advantages again. And it's clear that the objective is not just to have a competitive manufacturing industry, but most importantly to have an industry that creates jobs here in America. And so that said, <clears throat> Dr. Singerman and, and Ms. Uh, Wynne Smith, what safeguards can we put in place to make sure that the board created by this bill will indeed develop a strategy that is centered on jobs, job creation, and competitiveness? Well, I think in terms of the job creation opportunity, it's huge, but it has to be addressed in the context of the jobs of the future, not protecting the jobs of the past. And if we just look at the energy sector alone, where this country is poised to really have game-changing capabilities and resources for energy security, think of the manufacturing supply chains and the added value that will come if we could move out aggressively in that particular component of the manufacturing enterprise, energy alone. I would also add on the uh, job front that if we don't change, and this has been said, our training systems and training uh, in a way that recognizes the full component of jobs in 21st century manufacturing, we will continue to see other nations beat us in the global war for talent which is part of this. So I think we need to look at these issues in the uh, national strategy in a very broad way, but recognize the opportunities, not focus on protecting um, the jobs of the past. You care to respond? Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, just to, to build off uh, Ms. Wynne Smith's uh, comments, uh, in order to create the jobs of the future, we have to invest in research and development now, which creates the infrastructure, the technological infrastructure that enables companies like Mr. Models and others to uh, build specific products and provide specific services. Uh, the, the, the program that the President announced in March for a national, ne a national network for manufacturing innovation is designed precisely to do that and to solve a very particular problem that has arisen over the last three decades, the growing gap between basic research, which the federal government properly supports, and applied research, which is the province of the private sector. 
what we find is that there's a growing gap in the middle. Sometimes people call it the valley of death. And the purpose of these ma manufacturing institutes is to bridge that valley of death in a public-private partnership. That's the vehicle that this uh, committee has been talking about, the mechanism. And that's the, uh, the institutional arrangement that is conceived of and the development of the manufacturing institutes. So research and development, but in a collaborative, industry-led, academic, federally government-supported mechanism. Madam Chair, you may. The Chair recognizes Mr. Pompeo for five minutes. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I, I want to say uh, thank you to Mr. Lipinski uh, for working. You, you came with this legislation to me uh, several months ago and asked for my input. And I, I really appreciate that and have had the chance to, to try and help shape what we're working on. Uh, I'm, I'm often skeptical that another board, another agency will, will help us very far down the road. But I think this is a, a good step to, uh, uh, to, to get uh, the private sector engaged and come up with uh, some core principles that everyone can, can rally around. Uh, Mr. Model, I, I won't take my whole five minutes, but I want to ask you a, a question. Uh, uh, first, I want to thank you, Ms. Winsmith, for men, men, uh, men, mentioning energy. Uh, I agree. We have the opportunity with natural gas to change America's manufacturing sector for decades to come here. Uh, I wish we didn't have 10 agencies from this president investigating hydraulic fracturing today, which puts at risk this very renaissance that you spoke to. So I hope hope you all will take back when you talk to the administration that says this is important and we don't need 10 federal agencies regulating an industry that has regulated at the state level for years successfully and done no damage to groundwater anywhere, even according to Ms. Jackson from EPA. Uh, but that's a bit of an aside, but it is very important uh, from a manufacturing policy standpoint. Mr. Mo, you talked a little bit about um, the fact that you compete with international companies and sometimes those are planned economies. I came from the same place. I actually was in sort of the same business around the company did CNC milling and lathes. I actually, you probably wouldn't want me to make your part, but I won't hurt anybody around a CNC lathe. <laughs> uh, uh, but then you wandered off into space that I'm, I'm a little concerned. I wanted to get your thought. You said, well, they're planned, so we should do something about that. What, what is it you would suggest? I'll give you, you, you talked about in the context of solar. Uh, and so now this administration has subsidized solar technology and then now is making it even more expensive by creating a tariff barrier for entry of solar products. So we now have a belt and suspenders trying to prop up this particular sector. Is that the kind of thing that you think helps your business or another manufacturing company or the kinds of policies that would help? Well, it, it is a tricky issue, and, and I can't say, you know, if, if I would agree that that's the right route. I think we need to look at what the right route is, bring in experts and figure that out. My, my point being that, uh, you know, certain countries will do whatever it takes to make that industry compete, and how do we address that? I don't know the exact answer, but they will do whatever it takes. From my perspective, why are my largest customers deciding that it's no longer competitive to assemble and build their electronics and telecom housings here? primarily government policy in other countries who are making it that much more competitive. I've been told that my subcomponents are, are competitive, even with China's labor. I'm very efficient as, as sure. we talk. But I, when my largest customers simply choose to move their entire assembly operations out of this country because they say it's no longer competitive to do business here, there's nothing I can do about that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I would just, I would just suggest that uh, um, oftentimes those policies that those countries engage in do impact manufacturing here but they're really good for American consumers. <laughs> that is, that we end up with affordable projects that people that want and buy and products that are very affordable. When we put tariff barriers, we're simply driving up the very cost of the thing that we want. So uh, I can see this tricky, and maybe that's why um, we can get this group together and they can help us figure our way through this. With that, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Pompeo, and thank you for your work on this issue and recognize Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. My background is manufacturing. Um, I grew up, uh, my dad worked for Ford. When I was in high school, they shut the plant down. So my dad decided, he started on the factory floor, joined the union, worked his way through college kind of thing. And after they shut the plant down, he said, well, Ford's going to outsource. And I know how to make them. Maybe I'll start a business and make them for himself. So he started a business. After I got out of the Army, I worked with him until I came here uh, for about 20 years building a business. So I know manu aluminum factories, aluminum uh, die cast factories. We do a lot of tool and die. We build tool and die companies. And, and the one thing like and the shock that's always kind of around my public policy, the things I've been interested in, 
was I remember I showed up for high school football practice the first day of my senior year in high school, and people were saying, what are you going to do this year? And I said, well, I'm going to go to West Point, want to go to college. I remember a friend of mine saying, well, I got a friend that can get me on at Ford. And that was a legitimate economic decision for an 18-year-old to make in 1981 in our hometown. If somebody could get you on at Ford, you'd make more money probably than I would going to college. And uh, by the time we graduated, the plant was shutting down. And, and so, so I think you hit the point about trying to find skilled labor particularly, is that you can make a really good living in the middle class living in manufacturing. And I think that's why we're all longing to, to, to re bring it back so we can have the high school graduates go make a middle class living, but it's difficult to do that if you don't bring a certain skill. So I think that's gotta be an important part of the mix, and I think a lot of that happens in state governments, uh, in community colleges and technical colleges, but you know, people need to know there are $27 an hour jobs out there, if you go to, you don't have to go to college to get them, but you do have to bring something to the table uh, in order to get that kind of wage. And so that, that's just something that I, that's always been on my mind. And that's why I'm, I've loved manufacturing, love seeing products made, uh, not just manufacturing. I was, we were doing a hydro dam in my district and I was climbing over it the other day. And it's just, you see people working and building something that's gonna make a difference. And, and that's important. And I think we need to do what we can, uh, if this bill's the right direction to go, to come up with not picking winners and losers, but also but what is the government doing to prevent people from winning? And, and that's the question, uh, Mr. Model, you said that you're assemblers. That, that was a problem we had. We made uh, end caps for a, a little electric motor. Well, the, the, the father, the electric motor company moved to Mexico, and guess where the die castings went about a year or two later? To Mexico. And so we were able to do, we figured out we have to be highly engineered products, and we have to have skilled people build them. If not, they're unskilled people build un small products. And so that's what we did and have been successful with it. But uh, wh when your assembler says, I can't manufacture here, because I'm, a, I'm not competitive. Now some of that's wages, and we don't want to have Chinese wage rates. I, there's, I've been over there and seen, we don't want to pay those, and that's not building a country for us. I mean, it's better for them, it's lifting some of their people up, but that would not lift our people up. But what, what else are they saying? Because I know wage rates is an issue that we need to make sure that, you're paying good wages, you just need people that have the skills that, that demand, that have the productivity to demand that. So why are your assemblers? I know assemblers typically have a lot of labor. Yeah, um, actually, uh, particularly in the telecom industry, a lot of that integration is, is fairly automated. It's pick and place on, on circuit boards and, and assembly of the circuit boards. And the so labor's not driving their decision? I, I would say it, it's a portion of that, yes, but I, I also think that there has got to be, again, I'm not, in, I'm not running their businesses. Uh, right. I'm, I'm just, you know, guessing here, but I think it has to be a lot to do with the taxes, tax implication, the cost of capital. I suspect that they get some very low-cost opportunities to buy that expensive assembly equipment that automates it and to build those factories to do that, and, and I think they just get a lot more support from, from sometimes other countries who's, who are willing to court them. So they're not just moving to China for low cost wages, is what, there, there are a lot of There's things. There's a total package. Doing. Anybody want to talk about that? Because if we compare ourselves to China, Germany, Japan, and our kind of first world competitors, and any of you, what, what is, uh, would we see different that, that they're doing different that we could do better? Obviously, our, we have the highest corporate tax rate. And you just mentioned that. That's, that's obviously something that's got to be fixed if we're going to be competitive. But anybody want to talk on any of the uh, you know, let's start in left and go right, I guess. Is a I, I, I would just like to add that uh, if you look at Germany, which is a, which is a high wage, high benefit, uh, highly unionized country, they are a dy the, the, one of the world's most dynamic manufacturing and export based uh, based countries. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the signature um, activities that they engage in is a very um, active uh, uh, apprenticeship program. So they they have a very highly skilled level of um, of workforce, and, and these are these are people who don't have to go to college, but are are insured of uh, good quality manufacturing jobs that 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 are stable over time. Uh, what what one last thing? What the uh, the the German economy, the government has done is created a situation in which during times of economic distress, uh, workers are not laid off, but their work hours are reduced, mm -hmm. and so the dislocation to both the individuals and the firms is reduced. Mm -hmm. And when the economies pick up again, they can rapidly ramp up their activities without having to go back into the marketplace and compete for additional workers. Thanks. Thanks for that. And Ms. Wynne Smith, I think you had a comment on that. And well, I, I would just add um, another dimension, um, building on the, the comments about capital cost structure and regulatory environments as being very critical. And, you know, we're competing on that. 
that the United States and Brazil are the only two major nations that do not have a territorial tax system. So when U.S. enterprises are producing three times the value of all exports in growing markets in the emerging world, and this is good because these are customers and, and we want to have exports, and not being able to repatriate $1.4 trillion in offshore profits because of double taxation, that is certainly something that we need to change. And um, I was very interested that a whole group of Brazilian manufacturers said to their president, Dilma Rousseff, we have to get a territorial tax system because Brazil actually owns a lot of manufacturing enterprise in the United States. And they're, interestingly enough, not bringing that money back to Brazil. I hope more of it stays here. So that's one thing we need to do as a territorial tax system. Yeah, I'm out of time. I just want to close it. And you're right. The gentleman's time has expired. Time has expired. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and then some. But thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we do conclude the panel. Uh, we're trying to get the next panel in before votes start on the floor. So we all appreciate very much your testimony today. And uh, with that, thank you for being here. We look forward to working with you. And we'll take a very brief recess while we seat the third panel. Uh, and then begin immediately. So thank you again. All right, we are going to uh, begin resuming to the hearing with our third panel. Again, each of our witnesses has prepared an opening statement that will be placed into the record. Each of you will have five minutes to summarize that statement in your remarks. And joining us on our second panel are Jack Fitzgerald, owner of Fitzgerald Auto Mall. Welcome. And the Honorable Joan Claybrook, President Emeritus of Public Citizen and former NHTSA Administrator. Welcome to you both. Good morning. Yes, still. And thank you very much for coming. Uh, with that, Mr. Fitzgerald, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Ex ex no, we put you first. Mr. Fitzgerald, would you please begin your statement? Um, well, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, Mr. Butterfield, members of the committee. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here on behalf of NADA. Um, I was a car salesman starting in 1956. That's a long time ago, isn't it? And I've been a car dealer since 1966. Um, and I have lived these changes. Now, on behalf of NAD, I want to say I support 5859 for all the reasons that Congressman Kelly gave. On behalf of Jack, I want to say that I was probably cheerleading for this regulation in 1972 because I thought and still think that uh, even though she doesn't like me, I think she's done an awful lot for this country. She and Ralph Nader, who's a friend of mine, uh, I get along better with him. And Jack Gillis, whom I like to think is a good friend of mine too. These people have done good things for this country. But remember, if you think back, and if you won't, I'm so old, I remember all these things, but it, we were rethinking our souls in the 70s. Um, you know, the Vietnam thing. We were looking, re-looking at everything. Nobody ever came to this room to do something bad. The people that pass these regulations and pass laws, they come here to do what you do the best for the country they can. 
And in those days, we had a lot of work to do in terms of automotive safety, uh, gasoline mileage, um, you know, overall efficiency of our business. So the people that went after us, the industry, um, you know, they had a war to fight. Some of them still fighting it, but they've won. Our cars are vastly improved. They're safer. They're, they're more efficient. They do cost a lot more money, but they're wonderful products. So I'm not here to say anything bad about Ms. Claybrook or the people that got this law, but I would point this out to you. Um, there are lots of ways to get information on cars. My favorite is Consumer Reports, by the way, Consumers Union. This is the car book written by Jack Gillis, um, who's a disciple of Ms. Claybrook's. This one, by the way, was dedicated to you. Did you know that? Well, if you look at how to shop for insurance in this book, this guy gives you a, he, it's a, it's a real compilation of useful information for consumers. I've always been on the consumer side because they buy cars from me. That's rocket science, isn't it? But I, I believe very strongly in supporting all the consumer endeavors because they buy cars from me. And there's a couple of pages here, and there's nothing about uh, using that chart that we're talking about. And the reason for that, I, when I, I used to get it from the insurance companies before the government got involved. And I thought it was kind of neat. You know, it would tell you, uh, purported to tell you, if the car you're buying is going to have more damage than the next car that you might choose. Problem is, it's all historical, and it's arcane, and if you're not an engineer, Ms. Claybrook has made herself into an engineer. She studies stuff that I would never get to, and my customers would never get to. Um, it just didn't do anything for me. And I used to get the booklets from the Highway Law State Institute. We'll send that stuff to you for free, or they did years ago. I imagine now you just get it online. I used to get it in the mail, and I'd make copies of it and give it to my sales and say, you know, tell your customers about things like this. They'll appreciate it. Well, I don't think my salesman understood it. I think I probably misunderstood it, and I know the customers just didn't care. They didn't respond a bit. So I, I did not purposefully conceal it from them. If you look on my website, you will see I don't conceal anything. I put consumers' report on there, except they won't let me. But I, we tell them everything. That's how we do business. That's how I've always done business. And there was no concealing of this information from my customers. And I want to say, I think that this country owes a debt of gratitude to Ralph Nader and his army, of which he was one of the leaders, for the moving the ball down the field to make us take safety seriously. There's no reason for people to be dying in cars. I'm alive today because the government demanded that we have seat belts in cars, shoulder harnesses. And the, the car I, that, that I total lost was a former car driven by um, Senator um, Byrd from Virginia. It was a, I used to be a Ford guy, and I got the cars from Ford office. This was a big Lincoln Continental. I hit an old Mill 98, and I survived just fine because it had an interlock on it, and I couldn't not use the seat belt. So, I will never say a word in opposition to people who, make, who take on the effort to try and improve safety and improve efficiency in our automobiles. It's a tough job, but this regulation is a waste of money. And what's really historic Mr. is that you we need all you to wrap up. want to I'm do sorry. something about it. We have it. a vote on the floor. We need to, if you can conclude, well, please. I'm, I'm very grateful to you for considering that I've been in this town since 1935, and it's the first time I've ever heard of anybody repealing a regulation. I think it's wonderful. All I right. think it's historic. I celebrate it, and I congratulate you for willing, being willing to do it, and thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Ms. Claybrook, you are recognized for five minutes, please. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify this morning. I'm here to oppose this legislation. Uh, to repeal the important consumer information law, uh, subsection C of Title 29, uh, section 32302. And what this does is provide um, consumers with comparative information about motor vehicle makes and models uh, on the cost of repair damage, crash damage. Uh, auto dealers are attacking this as wasteful and obsolete. 
And while I appreciate uh, Mr. Fitzgerald's kind comments, I do disagree with him on this legislation. Uh, dealers claim that the consumer never asked for the booklet that is printed by the agency, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and sent to dealers each year. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, let's lay to rest the issue of the absence of consumer requests for this booklet. I have no doubt that consumers don't ask for the booklet. They don't ask for the booklet because they don't know it exists. How could they ask for something they don't know anything about? The consumer information requirement has suffered from a veritable conspiracy of silence. <clears throat> Excuse me. Neither the dealers nor NHTSA make any effort to inform consumers about its existence or usefulness. It's a self-fulfilling problem. The real question is whether consumers want information about differences in insurance costs for different makes and models of vehicles based on differences in damage susceptibility and crash worthiness. Has the NADA ever surveyed consumers to ask this question? Apparently not. Would anyone in this room want to speculate about how consumers would respond to that question? There's no doubt that consumers want accurate information about the cost to repair a vehicle they're considering buying because repair costs are a huge part of the expense of owning a car. Consumers are concerned about car insurance and repair costs just like they're concerned about gasoline prices. Every members, member of Congress knows how sensitive consumers are about that. Why has the gas tax been increased in recent years despite the funding of the highway trust fund, the needs for the funding of the highway trust fund? It hasn't because members don't want to touch a sensitive consumer issue, but they're willing to eliminate this particular requirement of consumer information. It's inter interesting to note that in today's economic cost information, such as vehicle damageability, is all the more important because consumers are struggling to stay afloat financially. Indeed, NADA uh, just last month attacked NHTSA's fuel economy standards, saying that they cost too much and made cars unaffordable. But while the dealers are willing to attack fuel economy standards on cost, they ignore cost savings to consumers uh, as they try to eliminate this requirement. And there are no doubt that the best place for consumers to get and evaluate collision damage information is at the point of sale, at the dealership. That's why the Congress passed the law in 1992 requiring dealers to distribute it. That's why the gas mileage requirement booklet is uh, to be at the dealership. That's why in 2005, Congress added a requirement that information about NHTSA's new car assessment crash test be listed on the Monroney price sticker so that consumers would have this information available when they went to buy the car. What new information does Congress or NAD uh, NADA possess that is persuasive uh, documents that consumers don't want such information at the point of sale? Uh, it's important to remember that a satisfied consumer is a repeat consumer, and dealers, as Mr. Fitzgerald mentioned, should be putting their, their, in, their consumers first. Uh, dealers claim that the current law is a waste of money, but their uh, bill would have NHTSA continue to collect and publish the comparative uh, collision cost uh, information and uh, probably just publish it on the Internet but not have it at the point of sale. Much of the cost of this program rests with NHTSA's collection and analysis of the information and not with sending a copy to each dealership. Uh, I would say that uh, in uh, 1991, in the proposed rule, NHTSA said that the economic effects of the requirements are minimal and no consumer, auto dealer, or anyone else uh, addressed the, or objected to the costs of the distribution. Having NHTSA put the information on the Internet, uh, as the Alliance of Manufacturers suggested yesterday, will do little to inform consumers in the throes of deciding which car to buy uh, when they're in the showroom. Technical and price information must be available to consumers at the point of sale, and I know that Mr. Fitzgerald is aware of the importance of that. The dealers claim that the current law is obsolete, but what is obsolete about getting collision insurance cost information by make and model when you buy a new car? As NHTSA pointed out it's in its proposed rulemaking, insurance data applicable to the collision portion of the insurance premium provided by the Hildy information on average represents 40 to 50 percent of the total premium cost to a car buyer. The dealer's primary claim for eliminating the statutory requirement uh, is that consumers aren't asking for the information, and that is an issue that is totally within the control of the dealers themselves. This attack by the auto dealers on consumer information about cl cl uh, collision damageability is not the first time that NADA has tried to stop this program. As noted in the March 5, 1993 rule, NHTSA asked NADA to allow the agency to use its list of dealerships to expedite the mailing of the insurance cost booklet to the dealers, but NADA declined to cooperate, and NHTSA was forced to get the information from the Department of Energy from, from the gas <laughs> mileage guide. <clears throat> Also, with regard to the obligation of dealers to make consumers aware of the insurance booklet, in 1993, NHTSA stated to ensure consumer awareness of the availability 
Okay, I, I will. Thank you very much. I would just say that it, it's um, it's very important that consumers get the information from NHTSA and that NHTSA could improve this information substantially and has not done so, nor have the dealers recommended that they, it be improved. And I would suggest that that's uh, another important piece of this. Thank you very much for letting me testify. Thank you both for your testimony. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes for questioning. And if I could, um, Ms. Claybrook, um, certainly thank you both for being here. But uh, in your opening uh, statement, your remarks, you uh, stated uh, that there was a veritable conspiracy of silence uh, on this. And, and I guess my question would be, this law goes back to um, 1972. The, uh, they were supposed to have this until by 1975. You're the administrator from 77 to 81. It's not implemented. Uh, they don't, uh, NHTSA doesn't issue a final rule to implement this mandate until March the 5th, 1993. Uh, so how do, we, how do we call it a veritable a conspiracy of silence when uh, when NHTSA didn't even implement it for more than uh, 20 years. Well, that is the conspiracy of silence because well. they didn't actually implement the law. And I will say that uh, with uh, in the absence of uh, having the insurance information available, which finally got produced by the uh, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety uh, with its HILDE program, it's called, uh, then finally there was information available to use. But the Department of Transportation did not have such information available and did work during my administration to try and figure out how to do that. But you would agree that delay did include four years with you as administrator of NHTSA? It did. Of it did. I, I would have liked to have been yeah. there longer and I would have taken more care of it. Can you, can, uh, when you look at the information, and this information that we're talking about, mm -hmm. which is a very small part of our regulatory uh, structure here, when we're looking at it, it's just measuring and showing the, the actual property damage to the, ve the, the cost of the repair for that vehicle. It doesn't factor in the other uh, things such as bodily injury or, or things of that in the insurance picture. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. It could. But, okay. but the law does not require it to do that. But the crash worthiness data is available with the new car assessment program that, that NHTSA implemented that I started. And is in fact in the 2005 okay. law now at the dealership itself, also on the Monroney price sticker. But uh, the the, uh, the information is that we have in the booklet that uh, NHTSA prepares is not verified information. They just use the information that's provided by the Highway Loss Data Institute. That's is that right, the correct. Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, which is the insurance industry. Right. Which right. in that they include uh, all the factors of uh, of costs that might impact, not just the crash, uh, the repair of costs for the cars, but the other things that are on right. there also. Right, they do. Okay, and so uh, this, is, uh, this is why we're looking at this one uh, regulation that is just a minor point that, that really doesn't tell us. And even in the information that NHTSA prepares, and you're certainly familiar with on right. here, uh, it clearly states that, therefore, to obtain complete information about insurance premiums, you should contact insurance companies or their agents directly. That's correct, and I think that that alone is a great piece of information for the consumer to have. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Mr. Kelly, who okay. testified earlier, said that, that he tells people to call their insurance agent, but in fact, most dealers don't do that. Okay. I'll uh, yield back my time, and right now I'll recognize Mrs. Uh, Schakowsky for uh, questioning. Thank you so much. Um, I, I appreciate your actually charming testimony, Mr. Fitzgerald. And I, I, I want to just say that I think I've been a consumer advocate for about as long as uh, uh, Ms. Claybrook has, has been, and we've worked together on many things. And I have to tell you, I was not aware of this document. And now having become aware of this document, I'm even more interested. And, and let me give you an example. I'm looking at a, a copy of it now. Nicely color-coded, which actually the NHTSA one is not, and perhaps the presentation of that document could be made more consumer friendly so people would understand. But if I'm buying a car, let's say I had a, a teenage driver. So insurance costs are really, um, you know, it, it, it very expensive. And I look at the Chevy Malibu, and for all coverages, it's at a, a 94, which is below the mean in, in terms of the... Um, uh, various uh, safety features and the collision costs, et cetera. Um, and, the, uh, and in the same category of four-door models is the Kia Optima, which is 134. 
um, so above the, the mean in the cost, and that is um, 38 points difference. And when I look at bodily inju injury liability, the difference is 56 points between the Chevy Malibu and the Kia Optima. I would be interested to know that so that I could be forewarned. And, and so my, my question really to you, Ms. Claybrook, is um, can you tell us what are, how, exactly what are the benefits to um, the, the consumer of having, and I think in a much more consumer-friendly way at the point of sale, this kind of information? And to me, it seems very important. Well, I think that <clears throat> I think the information that NHTSA publishes could be drastically improved. And um, I th particularly in the collision area, when you buy a new car, you buy collision insurance. Right. A and so 40 to 50 percent of the premium is collision insurance of your new car. And so that's why this is important, because it's going to tell you uh, that there are going to be vast differences between collision insurance for uh, one model versus another model. Right. That's the, the real importance of this, but in this particular format. Uh, I issued a standard for a five mile an hour no damage bumper. It was eliminated uh, by the Reagan administration. It's now two and a half miles, which doesn't mean much of anything. It allows damage. So if there were a, a really strong regulation, which there should be, to protect vehicles in damageability, this would be less important, but there isn't. This is the only thing that is available to the consumer on damageability of the vehicle. That's why okay. it's so important. And, um, and I'm disappointed that the... If the chair may interrupt, yes. uh, just to inform, we only have a minute left uh, for oh, votes okay. on the floor. If you uh, like, we can come back. Uh, just no, we, we, don't, we don't need to, uh, to come back. I mean, I, I think that the point has been made, and certainly in the written and the oral testimony, that this is, this is useful consumer information if it is made more accessible, I think, to consumers. I, I, I think that rather than eliminating it, I think that it would be much more important for NHTSA to, to bite the bullet and make it more useful. I agree. Thank you. Okay. Uh, gentlelady yields back. I want to thank each of you for being here today and remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record and ask the witnesses to please respond promptly to any questions that you may receive. The hearing is now adjourned. Thank you so much.